I hate sci-fi. With few exceptions, I find the genre overall to be dull, limiting, and filled with bloated plots and irritating characters that I personally find difficult to relate to. In Arthur Strugatsky's 1972 Roadside Picnic, this is not the case. This book was a breath of fresh air to the genre as a whole, and is still highly underrated and underappreciated, especially considering the time of the release as well as the strict censorship policies of the USSR at the time. The novel subverts almost every sci-fi trope and motif there is to the point of it almost not even feeling like a sci-fi novel. The only other author I can think of that employs similar methods would be Kurt Vonnegut, especially in Slaughterhouse-Five and Cat's Cradle. This review and analysis will be about my impressions of not only the book, but also later touching on the video game series that is based off this book, primarily Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl. Although they tell two distinctively different stories, I find it difficult to make an analysis of one without talking about the other as well. The main character in the novel is Red Shuart, a simple man who is a very intriguing choice of a protagonist for a sci-fi novel. He is not exceptionally smart, though not dull, and has no superhuman or abnormal powers. In fact, I would argue that his main traits are his insurmountable will to survive and his drive to provide for his family. In a genre plagued by two-dimensional cardboard cutout characters, superficial motives, and superhuman powers and abilities, this is a refreshing change of pace. This actually makes the character of Red feel more human, and thus his character arc all the more tragic. This is a great example of the Strugatsky brothers cultivating an effective protagonist while subverting typical sci-fi expectations of a main character and driver of the story. Another subversion of typical sci-fi tropes is the event itself that kicks everything off. In this novel, the catalyst that sparks the plot and creates the main set and setting is that aliens have landed on Earth for maybe a few hours tops. They leave behind a treasure trove of artifacts and technology that mankind has no ability to comprehend, and then leave. There is no contact, no diplomacy, and no transfer of knowledge between species. The best metaphor left to describe this event is made by a scientist who likens this to a roadside picnic, where the visitors who came did not stay very long and left behind a bunch of trash. A picnic. Picture a forest, a country road, a meadow. Cars drive off the country road into the meadow. A group of young people get out carrying bottles, baskets of food, transistor radios, and cameras. They light fires, pitch tents, turn on the music. In the morning, they leave. The animals, birds, and insects that watched in horror through the long night creep out from their hiding places. And what do they see? Old spark plugs and old filters strewn around. Rags, burnt out bulbs, and a monkey wrench left behind. And of course, the usual mess. Apple cores, candy wrappers, charred remains of the campfire, cans, bottles, somebody's handkerchief, somebody's penknife, torn newspapers, coins, faded flowers picked in another meadow. Eat up the cove with it. When they left, humanity, the wildlife in this metaphor, are left to pick up and examine the remains of what they left behind. If the visitors noticed us at all, they probably did not think much of us, and we were not even fit to be exterminated or colonized. The idea that the Strugatsky brothers seem to be demonstrating is that ultimately we are very insignificant in the scope of the universe. Although this event to the visitors was probably nothing more than a pit stop between star systems to them, this is hands down the most important event in the history of mankind. The landing area itself, known as the Zone, is a strange place where the laws of physics do not seem to apply and there are anomalies everywhere. A place where one wrong step can mean having your legs disintegrated by hell slime, a strange corrosive substance that eats through nearly anything. Other anomalies include strange, randomly occurring firestorms, and a meat grinder, an invisible and unseen anomaly that will take whoever steps into its proximity and tear their body to shreds in a twisting and contorting motion. However, also throughout the zone are the bits of aforementioned trash, sometimes referred to as artifacts, that were left behind by the visitors. 
pieces of advanced technology left behind by an unimaginatively more advanced civilization than our own. The book describes the brightest minds of the world researching these artifacts and labs, and the conclusion that the scientists come to is that we fundamentally do not understand how their technology even works. These devices do not seem to follow the laws of physics as we currently understand them. One of the scientists in the book compares attempting to study and deconstruct one of these pieces of technology to giving a microwave oven to Sir Isaac Newton. Although he may eventually begin to understand what it does, and maybe even how it works, he would have no idea of how to replicate the device or reproduce one. This does not, however, stop black markets from trying to get their hands on these artifacts. There is a massive demand for these strange and mysterious objects, and so naturally people will go out to brave the zone and its anomalies, risking death and worse to get their hands on these to sell to the black market. These people are known as stalkers and make their living navigating the treacherous and unforgiving zone. The government is not too keen about this happening, however, so they tighten security around the perimeter of the zone and slowly start building a massive wall around the whole area. Our main character, Red, is one of these stalkers. Despite going to prison, losing his only friend to the zone, and putting his life on the line, he keeps going back. To him, at least, the zone represents freedom and the independence that he yearns for. His daughter is even born with a severe birth defect, a common occurrence in the children of stalkers due to genetic mutations caused by heavy exposure to the zone. His daughter's entire body is coated with hair, to which he and his wife lovingly refer to her as Monkey. Red goes out of his way to try to provide for his family the best he can. He even pays local children at their apartment complex to play with his daughter to try to make her feel like a normal kid. As time progresses, Monkey seems to become less and less human, and is subject to screaming fits in the middle of the night. Also during this time, periodically corpses in the zone will reanimate and start wandering around. Red's father is one of these such corpses, and they end up keeping him around the house, occasionally giving him shots of alcohol that he seems to consume from muscle memory. These events seem to highlight the harsh and cold inhumanity of the zone, and maybe even Red's progressive loss of his own humanity, despite him trying to grasp control over him and his family's destiny. In contrast, the video game Stalker has nothing to do with the story, and yet everything to do with the story's themes of the insignificance of mankind, the shortcomings of science to explain the world, and the inhumanity of the zone. In the game Stalker, you are an unknown man suffering from amnesia and discovered in the wreckage of a body truck in the zone. You are rescued and take some jobs in an effort to regain your memories and identity of who you actually are. There are a lot of parallels shared with the book, including the hazardous anomalies and artifacts, the black market that buys them, the hostile military who attempts to keep people out of the zone, and also a wish granter supposedly at the center of the zone who will fulfill your conscious or subconscious desires. However, the story and narrative of Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl are not what I want to focus on when talking about it. To me, the plot and the story pales in comparison to the atmosphere and immersion of the game. This is a really rare example of a game based on, albeit loosely, on a book or movie turning out great, and in a way that takes its own spin on the source material while keeping the core themes and general impressions of it. It's difficult to talk about the atmosphere in this game without talking about the sound design. You can tell that the developers of this game spent a ton of time figuring out ways to constantly keep the player on their toes, especially during the underground levels in the Agriprom Research Institute and the laboratories. Almost all of the time spent in these locations is just downright unsettling, and plays into the player's sense of feeling like they are truly trespassers who do not belong here. This game sometimes gets described as a first-person shooter, however I disagree with this assertion. This is not a first-person shooter. This is a survival game with shooter mechanics. The player is constantly at odds with the environment, whether it be radiation, mutants, anomalies, humans, or the paranormal. Almost everything in the zone wants you dead. The zone is a hostile place and safe spaces are few and far between. However, when you do make it back through a long trudging journey and back into safety, oftentimes it is very comforting to just relax by the bonfire with your fellow stalkers and just listen to one of them strumming a melancholic tune on guitar. The game absolutely nails the feeling of the zone, not just in the very horror-driven subsections of the underground areas, but also in the massive outside areas as well. The zone in the game lends a lot to the book, 
and in both mediums the zone seems to represent our subconscious desires, drives, and fears. In a Freudian analysis of both the book and game, it could almost represent the id, or the subconscious instincts and drives of a human being that simultaneously is not subject to logic or rational thought. There really is no good reason for anybody to want to be here, and yet scores of people do enter the zone anyways. Some may go in hopes of riches, others for scientific advancement and world renown, and some even trying to reach the center to get a chance to ask a wish from the wish granter. In summary, Roadside Picnic is a sci-fi book for those like me who hate sci-fi, and Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl is a faithful adaptation that does not betray the book's core ideas, and instead expands the world with an amazing sense of depth and atmosphere. If you've made it this far, I'd like to thank you for taking the time out of your day to watch this video. This is the first video I've ever made and recorded and put up onto YouTube, so I do really appreciate it. If you've enjoyed this content and want to see more content like this in the future, you can always hit the subscribe button to stay updated. And if you have any suggestions for content that you'd like to see me make a review, analysis, or even just talk about in the future, go ahead and comment what you'd like to see. Thank you.